All right, welcome to the Pangburn Philosophy Podcast. This is Travis Pangburn. Today I'm speaking with Mohammed Kadra. He is an ex Muslim and the founder of the Jordanian Atheist Group. Thanks for coming on, Mohammed. No, thank you for having me, sir. Um, so, for those who don't know you, uh, who are you? Well, I'm a U.S. and a Jordanian citizen. I lived all of my life in Jordan. I became an atheist uh, about five, just, I think six now, six years ago. Um, I moved recently to the United States six months ago. Uh, but I, my entire life I've been in the Middle East, and I have witnessed um, or, or experienced what it feels like to be a fundamentalist and then experienced what it, what it is like to be an atheist in, the, in an Islamic majority country. Right. I did the... Yeah. Uh, go ahead. I uh, founded the Atheist Community of Jordan, which is an uh, an underground group of atheists and agnostics who meet on a regular basis, uh, and the, w w which turn which developed into a very close relationship with all of the members. And finally, I had to leave the country right so what uh it, you were forced out by uh them kind of catching on to who you were and they the, you th you thought they were going to find you or, or what was the main driving force well i went to the international conference for free expression in london in july of last year and then i, I gave this speech about islamophobia and how it is treated in the West and what is it really like in the Middle East. And then it, it began to be a little trendy and then it reached Jordan because I gave, I gave that speech in London and I went back to Jordan. So when I came back, uh, people started to notice that. And um, at work, uh, my the owner of the company got me in. He's like, what is this on YouTube? And... We had an incident in 2016 where one of our guys who published a cartoon mocking how uh, how ISIS view of uh, heaven is, which is basically how, how Islam's view of heaven is, but like he was just literally talking about ISIS. And the whole Jordanian community was asking for the government to get to him, and they did. And then they filed a blasphemy suit on him. And as he was walking down the the stairs of the courthouse after the hearing, he got shot three times by a former or a current imam. And then he was killed in 2016. So after 2016, the whole movement started to be more secretive than it already was. And after that video, we got a message from a friend uh, from a number in Ireland, which is weird. We got a message from a number from Ireland sending that you guys will be the next Mahat Hattar, who was the guy who got killed in 2016. Right. And that was the moment where I decided, like, five years is enough for, for Ken Jordan. Like, maybe I should consider leaving. Yeah, no kidding. So, so essentially, uh, so he he was being charged for blasphemy, and the penalty for blasphemy where he was being charged is is three years. That's the maximum. Uh, because Sharia law is implemented in the country, but not, not like Saudi Arabia or Iran. Right. So the original Sharia law is death. Yeah. But in Jordan, they just give you three years for blasphemy. Right. If, if you're if you're considered an absolute, you also lose your civil rights. Like you cannot inherit, you cannot marry. Even if you're married, you're divorced legally by the government. Uh, and the, with the blasphemy, you get fines and a maximum of three years in jail. So they did that to him. But the, the main threat, as you can see, if, which is self-evidently true, that the threat does not just come from governments. It also comes from a society that is taught that people who are apostates or mocking Islam deserve to die. Right, exactly. Um, so... Yeah, I mean, I can I can see why you wanted to get the hell out of there. <laughs> it um, and uh, feels kind of bad, actually. Yeah. 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 What like being forced to, to do it from a place that you you genuinely loved as a country, but you cannot be a true citizen 
if you're not a follower of a certain sect of a certain religion. Right. What did you love about your country? Well, it's uh, homogeneous a little bit more than here, and people are around the same. Nobody judges you as as much as they can do that in the United States. But I learned a lot from here, and like uh, I consider myself a citizen of both countries, and I appreciate them both. I even appreciate America even more. Uh, losing your family, like I can, you might not see them again, and losing all of your loved ones and who you, where you grew up just for the fact that you believe in something different right. is kind of sad. Are you uh, still in contact with your family? Yeah, I am. Yeah. How do you uh, how do you make that happen? Do you just have to use like untraceable phones, or 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 do you do you not go to that extent? Yeah, well, I don't go to that extent, but I'm considering it now because a friend of mine was sending me money about a month ago, and the intelligence got him for two days into questioning and like, where am I? Because I use my Jordanian passport to leave right. Jordan, so they consider me in, in Romania. Well, I took my U.S. passport from Romania all the way to the United States, and so they got him into question, like, where was Muhammad and all of that? And so, I don't know, maybe I should be more careful. Yeah. So what what ultimately uh, made you give up Islam? Were there, were there, um, were there writings you read that, that really led you to, uh, to atheism? Well, it started out very weirdly when I got encouraged by... When I was young, I was a kid, and uh, 9-11 happened, and I was fascinated by it. I was like, yeah, we took over, like, we, we hit America, the infidels. And I was like, I don't know, I think I'm third or grade or fourth grade. And this deep love of the caliphate and having Sharia implemented it worldwide got to me. And then I started, as I grew up, I started to be more and more religious and believing that we can only be great again if we can let Islam dictate what, what, how, how our lives and the lives of others are. And if we can have Sharia back and we can have the caliphate back, everything will be all right. So putting yourself so in, that, that, in, in that state of mind, um, were, like, were you experiencing the, uh, the severe abuse that women endure while you were, you were going through this and was just, this just looked at as, as normal for you? Of course. Yeah. I actually did it. Like, yeah. It's it's uh, it's a given, you know. You, you, and I I feel ashamed now. The the a very big part of my life I used to consider women as something inferior than men, or like homosexuals or people who just do not deserve to even stay alive. Right. Anyway, so that that whole mentality got me to be more religious and to try to either be a jihadi or either be a preacher and i decided to go like maybe i should be the preacher and let's study more and how study how how can i debate with people and convince them and that made me get gave me a, an, an idea of okay let's get out of the whole space of islam and look at all religions or actually let's go beyond that let's try to prove god and then prove islam then prove the sunni sect so you believe... and when I went out of that box, yeah, I couldn't right. just go back in. Yeah, yeah. So you made a, a definite choice there. You you could have you could have very well become a jihadist. Um, yeah. And, but you made the choice to to preach instead, or to to mm -hmm. and, and to go down the learning route, and and you chose essentially the the education side of that equation, and you started learning a lot more. Yeah, and I, as I learned a lot more, I found out that you can you can't actually prove God's existence. And then, when I went back to Islam, studying it without glorifying it, I began to see all of the flaws. And then I became an atheist. Um, why don't you uh, share with us one of your darkest moments uh, while you were trapped? by the chains of islam um is it did you inflict pain on people did you uh, uh did you ever hurt anyone well a friend of mine went to fallujah and did suicide bombing he was a uh, in my college class and 
I, although I did not participate in uh, these activities, uh, the the idea that I was jealous of him, I think that's the most dangerous thing you can feel because once you're jealous of someone, it's only just one more step where, where you just do the same as him. And I had that great jealousy of him that he achieved something. He is now in heaven and look at me. I'm just studying engineering and just going on with my life while he just protected Islam and just killed those Shiites. And that intense hate that was within me is, I think, is, is the most dark, darkest aspect of the whole thing. Right. And, uh, and assumingly, he believed, and you believed at that time, that he was in heaven with 72 virgins. Of course. Yeah. And is, this, and, and is that a big selling feature for, for men, uh, the 72 virgins, or is heaven enough on its own? I think heaven is enough is in, on its own. This is one of the misconceptions in the West that, uh, the, see, a lot of people here, and I've noticed that a lot since I came here, look at Muslims or like anybody who's outside of the West as like they're stupid enough that we have to think for them. Like, no, these are very intellectual people. Like, uh, So it's not the idea of like, oh, I just want women. So like, yeah, let's go kill. It's, it's actually way more beyond that and way more bigger than that. It's not my, the, 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 the sexual oppression that's, that's forced upon you by, by Islam is, is what makes you do all of these things. It's, it's the identity as a Muslim that is much more higher than a Jordanian or an American. Like you define yourself as a Muslim and you, you are ready to protect that faith and to protect uh, the prophet to protect God and to protect Sharia yeah. to where you you're able to kill yourself for it. But, even if I yeah. believe that, like my idea, if there was if the, if in Islam there was even no heaven at all, people would also do this. Yeah, because so, what, what the main concern is defending it. Yeah, what you've just just described to me sounds very stupid, mm -hmm. as far as like looking at what people are doing based on this, you know, fantasy. So that's mm -hmm. why, you know, uh, people of the Islamic faith get that reputation for seeming stupid because mm -hmm. a lot of them are doing stupid things, like blowing people up. Well, yeah, there are, uh, I wouldn't say it's not stupid, but yeah. I mean, the, what, what you're thinking about when, you, when you're filled with this hate is not like, if I do this, I'm going to get women. It's right. like, how dare this guy say or do that? Like, I'm going to kill him. Right, right. Yeah, and I mean, these are direct uh, orders from Allah. Well, the jihad is, is split into two. If, the, if there is a, a Sharia-ruled country, then that country, if it, you know, like or the caliph, if he declares jihad on something and there is an army that can do it, the obligation is lifted from all of the others who are not participating in that army. But because we, and, and when, when there is no caliphate or when there is a land that is occupied and, or there's a threat to the Islam world, jihad becomes an obligation on every single Muslim. Now, most Muslims don't actually do it, but it doesn't mean that it's not true. Right. Um, and let's go back a little bit to when you were younger, um, at home with your family. Uh, what did you think when you were when you were a young guy, uh, like seeing the role that your mother was playing in the home? Did you uh, were you indoctrinated at an early enough age in that you you just accepted this as normal? And did that affect your relationship with your your mother, did you always view your mother as uh, inferior to yourself, even as you were a small child? Uh, I believe it's more about sisters as inferior. So I, I used to be given much more opportunities and, uh, than my sisters. And I, uh, I was taught that I'm on a higher level than them. But my mother never indoctrinated me or any of that. I think the effect of the Islamic Brotherhood in schools and in the educational system 
at uh, in all all of the levels, even in college, had a very much more impact on me and others. Like people, uh, we, we used to have like math teachers who would give preaching in like the last five minutes of class when, when we were like in fourth grade. Arabic books that are supposed to just teach you Arabic are filled with religious texts and Quranic verses, uh, biology books that uh, there's like a in ninth grade there's I think half a page talking about about evolution and then right after it verses and verses of the Quran as it's supposedly disproving Darwin's theory. So religion is, is shoved in your head every hour and every day and in every aspect of your life, not just about the family. Yeah. So as far as I'm concerned, it's a parent's duty to look out for the well-being of their child. Um, mm -hmm. And in this situation, as far as, you know, you going to a school and being connected to the brotherhood that was helping to indoctrinate you, um, they, you know, morally, they should have protected you from this, but because of their own connections to the religion, they couldn't. They couldn't, or maybe they didn't feel that it's that bad. Like if right. you, no, if you, if you walk up the streets and you and you start cheering for nine eleven, uh, when nine eleven happened in Jordan or as it happened in Palestine too, nobody would be look, giving you the eye. Your parents, your your uh, local uh, community, or your close friends, nobody thinks that you're you're uh, you're on the way to being a bad guy or like you're way on a way to to commit terrorism. It's completely fine. It's the norm. Right. Do you uh, do you remember uh, exactly what what your day was like on nine eleven when it happened? Uh, I don't remember it specifically, but I think my sister called and said, "Open Al Jazeera. There's something big happening." And when we did, I saw the buildings. And I had no idea what those buildings are, but like my father was saying, like, oh, they hit America and those the jihadists or whatever. And then I was like, whoa, yeah, because and I think I was eight or something. Yeah. But I, I remember cheering, right. cheering for the for, for for where I was born. So you were an eight year old like, cheering, watching this. Uh, was it on TV? Yes. Yeah. So you're watching this on TV. You're cheering. People are dying. And your family, this is kind of like a, this is an exciting family event. Mm-hmm. Wow. Um, and, and what about, uh, when you were growing up, what was your, did you, did you ever sneak around and have, have girlfriends thing, break the rules outside your faith? Yeah. Which makes you, brings on a lot of self guilt within you which you try to redeem by going also to the extreme. Like when you start masturbating or seeing a, or calling like a girl or most relationships at that age were like, or just, just phone calls. You want to even interact that much. Right. Uh, but yeah, I used to sneak a lot. <clears throat> and then at 18, I just flipped back again. And I was going back to after like being a teenager, I started to be more aware of like, oh no, I'm doing wrong. I'm going to go to hell for all of this. And it's uh, it's a suffering within you, not just not just that you might bring suffering to your family or to to women or to homosexuals. It's also a suffering within you personally, where you are conflicting with your nature to please God. Now, did you have a uh, natural progression into lack of belief in gods? Was this? Uh, did you did you move to a more deistic view of God, and then eventually to atheism, or was this you went, you automatically saw the light and uh, you know the, you were cured? Mm -hmm. Well, most of it was automatically because, as I told you, when I was looking into how to convince those non-believers of Islam, when I went out of that box and trying to prove God, I stumbled upon a video of Richard Dawkins talking about evolution, and then I began to look more into all of that. And when I realized that you can't, I'm like, okay, if, if this theory is true, then I have to go back to see what uh, to see Islam back again but without giving it the glorifying eye or like reading the text as it's, as it's uh, the absolute truth. And then all of the things began to become clear. So it's not the idea of like, oh, there is a, 
a god somewhere or like a, um, a creator of the universe because I started from you cannot prove the creator of the universe. And so I, I think that I, I reached atheism way more faster than uh, someone who went to be a deist and then an agnostic. I, I, I think an agnostic and then an atheist, not a deist. Yeah, we need people to value evidence the way you did. Uh, we need that worldwide. And, and I mean, that, I mean, education is the antidote to uh, un, unreasonable, you know, anti-science. Um, and I think it's, it sounds like because you, when you had that choice, jihadism or, or priesthood or whatever you call it, um, you, uh, you made the choice to go the educational route. And I think that led you down a very, very good path. Mm -hmm. You can find good things in, in very weird places. Yeah. Um, so what about... Uh, what's your experience? Uh, were you around um, genital mutilation or female genital mutilation in your family? No, oh, no, 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 no. It's in Egypt and Saudi Arabia way more than Jordan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good. I, I mean, it's uh, it's one of the atrocities that I wake up and fight every day. Um, you know, the genital mutilation of children. I think it's uh, one of the greatest tragedies, if not the greatest tragedy of, of the world today. And um, I, uh, I think it's a worthwhile fight against any ideology that leads towards that. Of course. And it makes me think that our morals are, are not yet on the level where it should be. Like even in the United States, a lot of, there's circumcision, yep. hundreds of it, like for for male children, yep. and I've heard that there's some of that for female children, which is weird. Like if you do that, you can't do that in Jordan, but you can do it in America secretly. Yeah, yeah it's uh, and uh, it happens here, tragic. like for boys, and nobody, like uh, if, if me and you were there, we would freak out if we see it. And like, yes. It, you you'd imagine people would be messing in the streets for this, or like it's just the I, norm. I look at I yeah I view it as is this disgusting uh, tradition doctrine that's that's stuck with us, and people just haven't uh, applied the correct cognition to it. They, they haven't thought it through, and there's been mm -hmm. circumcision apologists coming out of the weeds. These these doctors who release these very pitiful. Not not scientific journals, just articles that no one has mm -hmm. has uh, falsified or had the chance to falsify um, about you know these these very apologetic reasons as to why uh, you can uh, circumcise a, a baby boy and they are just bullshit and the scientific community has already uh, weighed in on this and said that male circumcision uh is dangerous and it should not be carried out but it's like it's not only that it's like it's not only dangerous and should not be carried out it is a disgusting immoral act that many mm -hmm. otherwise morally sound people do mm -hmm. and actually i was uh, yeah sorry to interrupt well, you my friend yeah. just finished nursing school in the united states and i asked her about circumcision in America, and she and I told her, she told me that if you have a kid in the United States, they would automatic automatically circumcise him. Oh, uh, like uh, the only way to stop it is that you tell them right when you have that kid wow. that please do not circumcise my child. That's insane. It's not like they come and ask; they automatically do it. You just have to inform them that you don't want this happening to your kid. That's the only way for them not to do it. They're performing this is in America. Yeah, they're performing a non-medically necessary surgery on an infant mm -hmm. on the table right after it's born and very vulnerable. This is like this is a story that our ancestors, or sorry, our. Um, our future generations are going to look back on and just shake their head and be like, these people were developing rockets. They were going to the moon. They were building uh, space vehicles. They, they, I mean, they were eradicating disease and they were still hacking at the genitals of babies and children. Mm -hmm. it's just, it just baffles me. 
Um, so how about a book? Are you working on a book of any kind to talk about your experiences? Uh, yeah, a little bit, but um, yeah. I think it will take a while. As you can see, my English is not that perfect, so I'm trying to just improve my vocabulary more and then maybe build from there. But like, uh, yeah, I've been like, uh, a little, I think a quarter way through. Yeah, well, you're, I mean, to me, uh, your English sounds great. Um, so what, uh, what kind of dreams and aspirations and goals do you have, uh, career wise? What do you want to do with your life? Well, uh, I learned, uh, my dream has always been, uh, was to become a lawyer and I have a bachelor in civil engineering, but, uh, as I've learned here that in the United States, you don't take law as a bachelor. So you, you have to take a bachelor and then do it. So it was I'm glad that I've already taken halfway through that. So my intention is to take the LSAT and just apply for law schools. Right. And are you uh, are you interested in doing more speaking about your um and, and and continuing your activism? Of course. I would never stop that. Right. Um what about uh do you still have friends that are kind of on the inside of of Islam back home that you're still in communication with or have you been completely cut off from them? I was cut off from, I would say, 98% of all the, call, uh, not not extreme, but like religious Muslims right. who were my friends by that time. Like I spent the last year of college completely by myself, uh, but I had like, I think, two Muslim friends right now who are in Jordan. And that's about it. But like I used, I lost all of all the other ones. And I, one, of, one of my close friends was a, was a Salafi. And he, when I became an atheist, he's like, okay, let's debate. And then, like, if you convince me, we can stay friends. And I was like, okay, let's debate. And one of the things about the debate was a question that I asked that if somehow uh, the ISIS came in and uh, took over Jordan, what's going to happen to my family? Because the religious law says that my mother and sister has to be taken as sex slaves because I would be fighting ISIS. Like, what are you guys going to do? And he's like, of course we'll take them. <laughs> wow. And that was the end of the friendship from my side. I didn't yeah. even wait for him. So you were, uh, you were speaking at a, uh, secular conference. I believe it was 2017. And you were talking about on uh, how much of a, um, inspiration Richard Dawkins was for you. Um, mm -hmm. why don't you uh, speak a little bit about what his writings have meant to you? Well, uh, the first book I read about atheism was The God Delusion, which I found that it wasn't even illegal in Jordan at that point. And uh, I bought it, I think, a month after I found out the videos, and I was just excessively watching everything about evolution. And then I bought the book, and that was the, when I realized, like, the, the, like I'm 99.9 sure that there is no God. Right. Uh, the funny story is, uh, I went back to that library to buy the, to, to see the book again, and uh, this guy was asking for it too. Turns out it's now illegal in Jordan. Like after like I think a few months after I, I bought it, so now it's illegal in Jordan, which is which is I think has something to do with the increasing number of atheists in the Middle East. That now the government started to realize like, oh, there are books that are coming here. Uh, shouldn't be about what one of the things I admire about him is what he did is a project of translating his book and putting it free for people in the Middle East right. to read. Mm -hmm. And the, and yeah, the, this is a this is a, a recent venture by Richard. Um, I think uh, I've seen some some uh, posts and stuff about it recently, mm -hmm. um, and I think it's. Great. I, his his he's done so much for skepticism, humanism, science, um, and the eradication of of nonsense that he has accomplished in his life is just phenomenal. Um, mm -hmm. Millions and millions of copies downloaded in Arabic of the God Delusion, mm -hmm. which is a, a an amazing accomplishment. So I work with, uh, I, I spend quite a bit of time with Richard on a yearly basis. Um, we do 
a lot of events uh, with him. Um, I would love to invite you to come down and meet Richard at some point uh, if you're interested. Oh, thank you. I'd be honored. Yeah, yeah, and bring your book. And, uh, and a lot of people, a lot of people, uh, like might not like him or like say something about him. But what I want those people to always think about is consider someone like me or any other atheist who's from Jordan, Saudi Arabia, or Iran, or all these countries. But if I didn't stumble into that video, and I didn't go through his book and didn't go through all of these ideas like because somebody chose to be an out atheist somebody chose to speak against religion i bet you that there is somebody who was eventually going to be a jihadist and just stopped because he became an atheist so it's not that it's just frees people I, the idea of you being outspoken and to be a scientist and be outspoken about it too so it's not just the idea of freeing people. It's the idea that you might actually save lives while yeah, doing that. Exactly. I would. It would be so interesting if we could have in our hands the figure of how many lives Richard has saved with his work. Uh, and mm -hmm. I'm sure that number is astronomical. Mm -hmm. Well, it was uh, excellent. To, uh, I'm, I'm glad you came on the podcast today, Mohammed, and I would love to speak with you again at, at some point. Thank you. Yeah. It was a pleasure. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for tuning in, everyone. This has been the Penguin Philosophy Podcast, and let art and science inspire.